Great. Hi, we're Team Deepfakes. Um, we, ten weeks ago, we were tasked by our sponsors to look into the, men, the detection methodologies for deepfakes. Um, however, after 102 interviews, we realized that the people that actually fact check information and may see deepfakes on their screens cannot currently cope with the number and scale and volume of videographic misinformation. And we realized that we needed to speed up the workflow for them to tackle this problem. So as you heard from the video, a deep fake is any piece of fake videographic content that has been generated using AI and deep learning techniques. We came in with some original assumptions that shaped our first three weeks of customer discovery. We believed that deep fakes were a current problem and that some tools were already out there to detect them and that our main beneficiary would be within the intelligence community. So therefore, as a result of those assumptions, we believed that we had already figured it out. We jumped straight to a solution without actually talking to anyone that had the problem or might use a solution. And the teaching team said to us, stop, take a step back, think about who you're doing this for. So we thought about the, ICE, uh, the intelligence community as one of our main beneficiaries. And this is a quick excerpt of a conversation with them. What you can take away is that due to confidentiality issues, they really couldn't tell us much about the problem they were seeing or their workflow. So this led to the key insight one. Um, our main beneficiaries were not going to be in the intelligence community or their forensic analysts. And we realized we needed to find a proxy in the private sector. So we thought, who else might have a vested interest in the deepfakes problem? Our immediate thought was social media, news organizations. But we quickly realized that these organizations themselves were very hesitant to take ownership of the deepfake problems and often outsourced much of the heavy lifting with this to, th to third parties. So at this point, team meetings had gotten to this stage. Uh, we struggled to find anyone who cared, um, and team morale ended up an all-time low as we didn't know who the deep fake problem, like who had even, who even had the deep fake problem. And what we realized is that these organizations were outsourcing the problem to third-party organizations. Uh, social media and news told us that they gave it to people that labeled themselves on LinkedIn as fact-checkers. And these individuals, these fact-checkers, either uh, worked themselves or were part of larger organ fact-checking organizations. So we realized, well, if the intelligence community forensic analysts can't talk with us, let's find their proxies, these fact-checkers, and let's try to figure out what their problem is. So we made a big pivot to focus on the fact-checkers. And what we heard is, well, we asked them, what is, are deepfakes a problem to you? And what we heard is that deepfakes right now are actually not a problem, because even though they think deepfakes are going to uh, impact them in the next few months to a year as like state-of-the-art technologies for manipulating, manipulating video, we heard that there are actually much simpler ways of doing this right now, and all the volume of information they're seeing that they need to fact check are done with these simpler ways. So we call these shallow fakes. As opposed to deep fakes, which are created with deep learning technologies, shallow fakes can be made with CGI, Photoshop, all those traditional techniques we know. And if anyone saw the Nancy Pelosi video on Facebook that was shared last week, which had a huge impact and caused a lot of stir, 10 minutes of work could turn into 10 million controversial views. So our key insight here was that really it wasn't deep fakes, it was shallow fakes, it was misinformation created with standard techniques. So we focused on this problem. And from talking with fact checkers, we found out that they had three main pain points in their workflow. One is that there's simply too much content to fact check. The volume of information they wake up in the morning and see on their desk is just way too large. Two, the timelines are getting shorter. They don't have time to get through this volume of information. We asked people, when is your deadline? They said, our deadline is now. We need to get this story turned around now. And three, a lot of these fact checkers are self-taught. They come from a lot of different backgrounds. And so they don't quite have the standard tools to do their process. They just learn from looking online, from hearing from people at conferences. So from their workflow, we realized that the entire process can take anywhere from four hours to a whole week. 
and that it's simply too long. It, doesn't, it can't keep up and it can't scale with the volume of misinformation that these fact checkers are seeing. So what can we do to speed up this process? In our conversations with fact checkers, we realized that we had two opportunities where we could add value. We could automate repre uh, repetitive processes that they use to fact check content and amalgamate tools that they use to fact check all on one platform. So the result of this was a forensics tools platform, which combines the best tools recommended by media forensics experts and um, all in, uh, which combines best tools uh, recommended by media forensics experts um, and uses the best user interface to allow fact checkers to tackle this problem at scale and volume. We went to the misinformation workshop, the web conference in San Francisco, and talked to fact checkers and journalists directly about our minimum viable product. We talked to fact checkers and journalists at a variety of organizations, including CNN, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and Storyful, a fact checking organization to gain their insights on whether our minimum viable product would be of use to them or not. And the feedback that we got was stupendous. They told us that they would definitely use our product and that this was amazing because journalists don't need lists to tell them how to fact check something. They need a tool that actually allows them to do the fact checking. And from continuing to talk to fact checkers, we realized that there were a couple of key areas on which we could improve. For example, we could take all of the different processes on this platform and condense them down into one concise report that a fact checker could present to show how they went about fact checking a piece of content and also adding other tools that added value such as having a controversy index or some kind of integrity score that allowed a fact checker to determine to what degree of manipulation something had been uh, manipulated. By now we had an MVP that our users loved, so we moved on to establish monetizability. But we quickly learned that there's hardly a hundred full-time fact checkers all across the US, and even those who work full-time in the industry, they operate on shoestring budgets, so they really can't buy our product. Um, this was a low point for us, because without a paying customer, all of the work that we'd done into building our product seemed kind of a dead end. That's when the teaching team told us to step back and look at foundations who might, uh, whose missions might uh, align with ours and that we could work with and potentially raise funding. As we looked into these foundations more, we also came across venture capital funds in the synthetic media space, as well as news and media initiatives that could be sources for future funds. And this was great because we, could, we were now seeing uh, potential funding avenues. Uh, and, as, um, and as a result of finding sources for future funding, we were now determined to prove economic value to our potential investors by identifying an exact economic buyer. And our interviewees actually opened us to an, a whole new market. They helped us realize that if you could help big organizations protect their brand reputation, they would pay you a lot of money to use that product. And with an entire new pro uh, market that we could intervene in and provide unique value in, we had a dual-use product. This was great because we were now looking at continuing this product beyond the class, and having an entire huge market that we could intervene in was amazing for us. Um, and as we looked deeper and um, reflected on all our learnings from the past 10 weeks, we realized that one, the IC analysts and commercial fact checkers, they had similar workflows. So we had a solid dual use product. Now we also had brand protection as a new market that we could diversify in. Moreover, we realized that in the past 10 weeks, our interviews had really changed. When we started out, our interviews, uh, interviewees didn't really know what deep fakes were or what the difference between a deep fake and a shallow fake was. But by now, we were talking to people who knew exactly how the Nancy Pelosi video, for instance, had been altered. And so we realized that this was the perfect time to intervene with growing awareness as well as an increasing ubiquity of tools. And this led us to a week 10 pivot. Three of us will be continuing this project beyond the class as a startup called De Facto Labs. Our goal is to connect both the public and private sectors with cutting edge technology to help tackle the misinformation problem quickly and efficiently. 
Um, we uh, made our first public appearance in New York at a synthetic media conference um, organized by a venture capital fund where we talked to a lot of investors. Um, they had immense interest in our product. And we'd love to hear what you guys think. If you, had, uh, if you have feedback for us or would like to work with us, we'd love to discuss our next steps with you. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the people who supported us through this journey. Um, the, all of uh, the things that we've learned and we've built, it would not have been possible without our mentors, sponsors, as well as the teaching team. Um, they were here to check us when we were flying too high, as well as show us direction when we were totally uh, without any motivation. So thank you so much.